Good to be here tonight. Am I the only one? Am I the only one that's getting bothered by all this stuff floating in the air? It's other people too, huh? I I can just imagine. I didn't have. I never had an allergy during allergy season. I never used it. Not as a kid, as a young man. It wasn't until I turned about forty years old that it was this time of year and it's just as everything's starting to bud and and i can always tell that the junipers which is cedars and so on uh they start putting theirs out first because i remember the first year i i this hit me i mean it hit me hard and my eyes burned and itched the inside of my mouth itched And I would just be miserable, absolutely miserable. And, uh, of course, in the state of Missouri, if you let any piece of ground go fallow, where it's not tilled, nothing's planted on it, cattle don't graze on it or anything like that, in 10 years' time, you're going to have a cedar thicket. Because Missouri is full of of cedars that will never ever run out of cedars in the state of Missouri and I don't know why it's here but anyway so that when that juniper starts coming out didn't bother me too bad last year but it is really bothering me again this year and uh, so I sympathize with everybody that's coughing and sneezing and itching all over and everything like that I'm I'm right there with you Uh, I realized that that what it was because that went on for like two or three years and then the next spring I could tell the juniper was kicking in and starting to make my eyes burn real bad and we had a preaching engagement down in Arkansas Arkansas is always going to be ahead of us as far as um, spring is concerned it could be just barely blooming here but down there everything's in full bloom because of the warmer weather and when we left Missouri and got to Arkansas, I noticed an immediate difference that that time had already passed down there and I escaped it. So, yeah, it was worth it. But anyway, taking a lot of Benadryl to just kind of keep it calmed down and keep you sane. When you got places to scratch that you can't scratch, that bothers you. John chapter 3, if you would, please. Um... God's been good, amen. God has been good this week. I want you to pray for Brother Sterling. uh, uh, He's had a bad day today, from what I heard. Um, And so just kind of lift him up. Um, And um, he has those every now and then, where he just doesn't have the energy, doesn't have the strength to get up. But sure was glad to see him here Sunday. I know that he felt good coming. And I think, I don't, I think it didn't matter how he felt Sunday. He had made up his mind he was coming to church. And uh, so we rejoice in that, that he was able to come. And you pray for him and Sister Gloria and pray for others. Um, pray for, and I'll mention this later on in the prayer request, pray for Philip. Uh, he's gotten himself in some pretty deep trouble. And um, so it, the charges that are against him are federal, not state charges. And that's serious stuff. And uh, so just pray for him. Uh, I love him. I care about his soul. I know him. I know what he has been through in his life. And the things that he does with his life, I can take you and go back to his past and show you exactly why he does what he does. And um, parents, love your children. Raise them right. They're, and they don't get a beating every time they do some little piddly thing wrong. That's abuse. Correct them verbally. 
correct them with love. If that don't work, then correct them with a rod. It's that simple. But show your children love and compassion. And uh, it will make a difference on them. So pray for him and pray for uh, others tonight. We'll read the list here in a little bit. John chapter 3, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus on how to be born again. So we pick it up in verse 10 of John 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knoweth not these things? Uh, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, there it is again, in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's now said that twice in two consecutive verses. He is saying, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. And those two words are interchangeable. And I've heard preachers say, no, one means one thing and the other means another thing. I just think they mean the same thing. Eternal and everlasting. If it's everlasting, it's eternal. And if it's eternal, right, you can have an everlasting gobstopper or you can have an eternal gobstopper. Either way, you've got a gobstopper. Uh, Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came the first time. It is why he's coming the second time. But it's not why he came the first time. He loves humanity. He loves people so much that he willingly offered himself as the Lamb of God in order to take away the sins of the world. That the world through him might be saved. And there's a difference between might and shall be saved. Now, maybe I'll explain some of this here in a little bit. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us into your house tonight. We thank you, Father, Lord, for all of these that have joined with us online. I pray, God, that, uh, Lord, you'd just send a blessing down from heaven for them. Teach us. Show us great and mighty things that we know not. Remind us of things, God. This right here tonight, Lord, that we're studying, it's the simplicity of the gospel. Help me, Father, never to make it complicated. Never try to make it nearly impossible to achieve because it's not. If we would just set our minds and our hearts that we believe what you said, God, you'd save us. And it's that simple. So, Father, show us your way, show us your gospel, and then help us, Father, to take this gospel out to other people and give them words from your word that they would be not able to gainsay nor resist. Father, we just ask your blessings and your touch upon our lives. Thank you, Father, for the days that you've given us since Sunday morning when we last joined together. We pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless the days that come ahead of us until the next appointed time when we come together. And Father, that your kingdom would increase, that your people would grow strong in faith, God, that you would just open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings to your people tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. I want you to look back up at verse 12 and 13, John 3. He tells Nicodemus, I have told you earthly things and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man ascended up to heaven, uh, I lost my place here, uh, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, 
which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, if you've, uh, if you've been following me on the Watchman broadcast and the l last week's Pastor Mike Online broadcast, which um, Paige came to me and she wanted to, somebody apparently had called and wanted those teachings on DVDs. Well, I don't normally put the Pastor Mike Online teachings on a DVD. I put them on an MP3 disc and they, they hear the audio. But what I've done is, and I think I have the master recorded already. It's been working on it all day. The two Pastor Mike Online broadcasts from last week, plus the last two Watchmen broadcasts that deal with the Catholic Mass, the Eucharist, what they believe about it, and the fact that it's wrong, biblically, I'm, I'm going to have those on DVD. And so, here's I'm going to say this publicly. If you know somebody that needs to see, needs to see these discs, these teachings, to show that the Catholic Mass... By it, at its very core, is blasphemy against God. Then call our office or send us an email and we will get you those discs. Now, let me say this. Because we've had people do this before. We have a mailing list where we send out our DVD. Everything we do in a month, we send it out once a month to people who sub they subscribe to it. We don't take any money for it. We don't require any money for it, but people give. And um, in the past, we've had people call our office and say, yeah, I've got four families I want you to put on your mailing list. And at the time, we didn't, it, we, it didn't click you know, what they were doing. So we'd put their names on the mailing list. Well, all of a sudden, we started getting these packets sent back to us. Uh, because they were being refused or they were being thrown in the garbage. And here lately, we've gotten a call from somebody who's been very, very rude to the girls, threatening to sue us for harassment because he is receiving our DVDs in his mailbox. And he's let out a few choice words. And I told the girls, next time he gets on the phone, you send him up to me. I want to talk to him. I just don't go for that kind of stuff. So I'm asking you, if you know somebody that you would like for them to have these discs, call us. We'll send them to you. But you should be the one to, to give it to the people that you know. Okay. Uh, that way, it's not a waste of our resources. We know that some people just get the packets. They know what they are. They just throw them right in the trash. Well, that's a waste of the Lord's money. And so I, I would ask that you not do that. And so anyway, but if you, if you want copies of this, it's a four DVD set for your free love offering of $89.95. Free love offering. No, uh, we don't charge for it. If you call and say, hey, I need some copies of that, we'll send them to you. If you want to copy them yourself, give them out. That's exactly what I want you to do about it. But I think it's important now. We're broadcasting these teachings over to Kenya. The Catholic Church has a very powerful stronghold in Turkana. They've got a high place there in Turkana with a big statue of Jesus up there, carved image. And God said, no, don't do it. So anyway, um, I've been teaching about the Catholic Mass. Dee reminded me her mother's Bible was a Catholic Bible. And she lent it to me one time because she said, yeah, I read some of the stuff that's in here. And it had a bunch of articles about this and that and the other. Had it a, had a Catholic encyclopedia in it that described some of the things that they believe in and so on. 
but it had basically a teaching on the sacrifice of the mass. And it was explaining to the people who go to the Catholic Church what each part of the mass ceremony represents. And I've got Chris transcribing that for me. I've tried to scan it. It's a very delicate book, so I can't put it in the scanner itself. So I'm having her retype and transcribe what's in there for me. But I'm, and she's going, this stuff is crazy. Said, yeah, I know it. But over a billion people in this world believe it. But what she said was, she, Dee reminded me, she said, Pastor Mike, remember in what that book that you saw, they literally believe that they can call Jesus down from heaven. And it says that word for word in their Bible, in their uh, text explaining what, how the mass works, that they literally bring Jesus down from heaven to take on the form of the Eucharist that they tell you you must eat or you cannot go to heaven. If you don't eat the, if you don't eat the sacrifice of the mass, if you don't eat the Eucharist, you cannot go to heaven according to them. And so look at what he said here. He said, no, verse 13, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. And can anybody bring Jesus down from heaven? The answer is no. Turn to Romans. I think it's where it is. Romans 10. And the more I read about the way Catholics think and the way they explain their theology, the more gobsmacked I become. Gobsmacked, that's what Britain's people say. I was absolutely gob gobsmacked. That means it knocked them off their horse. They about fell out of their chair. That's what it means. And so, um, in, I'm in 1 Corinthians. Romans chapter 10. He says, um, oh, let's see here. Verse 5, Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this, this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above. And the answer is no one. So according to Paul in Romans, who has the power to bring Christ down from heaven to this earth? Nobody. But they teach that the priest does have that power to call Christ down from heaven. And that's their words. Jesus has left his position in heaven and has come down to the earth to take the place of the Eucharist so that you are literally eating a piece of meat of Jesus Christ. That's sick. It's disgusting. They call that cannibalism. Is what that is. So... Um, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I want you to notice one word in verse 14, and I want you to underline it or circle it or highlight it with your yellow highlighter. As. A-S. It is one of the most important words in the Bible. As. Because whenever you see that word, God is going to teach you a very fundamental, profound doctrine by way, no, number one, of saying it plainly. But number two, he always has a figure of it in the Bible. So, what, what was the type... Who was it that played the typological part of Jesus when Jesus described how he's going to be in the heart of the earth for three days? Who played that part in the Bible? Jonah. 
For as Jonas was in, see the word as? As Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. What famous Bible story depicts the appearing of Christ and him gathering together his saints and God pouring out vials of wrath on the earth. What story in the Bible did Jesus choose to show you what it was going to look like? As it was in the days of Noah. He, he said as. So right here. Uh, let's see what, what verse were we in? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So what God's doing, what, here, what Christ is doing, he's showing you a Bible symbol, a Bible picture, and a Bible illustration of that event. So let's go back to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Whenever I, if I'm just sitting in my chair, thinking, musing, meditating on these things in a biblical way. If, if, if I think, if something pops into my head that I never really understood before, never thought of it before, if something comes to me. Before I run out and start telling everybody, oh, you should hear what God just told me. I wait until I know I can verify it with number one, a plain word for word teaching of that from the Bible, number one. And number two, my mind starts flipping through the stories in the Bible to see if there is a story that portrays that. So we mentioned as Jesus being in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And he talked about Jonas was a picture of that. But there's another picture of that. It's Joseph. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. Joseph would not sin with her. That makes him sin free. He's sinless. He's not guilty. He's innocent. And yet. Joseph must pay the price for somebody else's sins. You see that? And as he is in the dungeon, under whatever building he was in, under the palace or whatever, as he's down there, he's prophesying to people down there. First, the butler says, I had a dream. And in this dream... And he goes on to talk about the dream and Joseph says, uh, what's going to happen in three days? You're going to be lifted up out of this prison and you're going to hold Pharaoh's cup once again and squeeze the wine into his cup. And lo and behold, three days after that, that's exactly what happened to the butler. He got restored to his original position. He was pardoned from all of his sins. The baker said, uh, Jesus, I had a dream too. And I had a dream that there was all kinds of baked meats, baked goods on my head. And what does that mean? And Joseph said, well, I hate to tell you this. But you're also going to be taken out of this prison in three days. The baker's going, yeah, yeah, sounds good. And then they're going to hang you on a tree. They're going to execute you. And in three days, that is exactly what happened. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, when, he, when his body lay in the tomb, his soul departed into the interior of the earth, the heart of the earth. And the Bible says he preached to those spirits in prison. And Joseph is a picture of that. Okay? So... What Jesus is telling us, 
What I'm about to do on the cross, there's many types and many stories in the Bible, but he picked one in particular. And it's Numbers 21, verse 5. The people spake against God and against Moses. Do we, is there anybody here who, before they got saved, spoke against the Bible and preachers and churches. What is your deal? I'll say you were lost. Hey, I did it with the King James only people. I spoke evil of them. I mocked them. I laughed at them. I scorned them. I thought that I was superior to them. And God's sense of humor, he turns me into one of them. That's a joke, God. Okay? He turned me into one of them. Okay? But the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread. Neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. It, there, it wasn't that there wasn't any bread. God gave them bread every day. They said, we want something different. And that's our nature. We get a cable system. We get a satellite TV system. We have this brand new remote. The satellite TV company gives us 700 channels worth of programs to watch. And what do we do? No, I don't want to watch. No, not that either. I don't want to watch that. And if you can go through 700 channels and not find anything for you to watch on TV, watching TV is probably not what you need to be doing right now. That's our nature. But anyway, verse 6, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. I'm going to explain these serpents in a minute. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away um, the serpents from us. Now, here, since Jesus drew our attention to this passage, let's understand what's going on here. First of all, they sinned for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. That is God sending in the fiery serpents, biting the people, and the people are dying because they were bitten by these serpents. They're literally dying all over the place. Dead bodies laying everywhere. And serpents everywhere. Into the thousands of people have died now because of this. And so... Um, what you're seeing here is a picture of how God works in salvation. Because when the rest of the people of Israel saw that those people had, that had murmured against God had been bitten by the serpents and then within hours or minutes fell over dead, they understood this is the wrath of God on us for complaining and groaning and crying out against God and against Moses here in this wilderness. And so what they did was they went to Moses and they confessed their sins. And let me tell you something. If you, if you watch the internet enough, you're going to find preachers and they may be using a King James. But you're going to find preachers who will tell you that repentance is not necessary for salvation. And that's a lie. I mean, look at this story again. Therefore, the people came, verse 7, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord. Can you show me anywhere in here where Moses said, Repent or receive the damnation of God? Did Moses say that? What was their natural inclination to do when they started seeing their friends and loved ones being killed by these serpents? It was automatically in them 
to go before God and confess their sins and repent. And I've had, I've got people who are calling me a false prophet. Because one day I, I set up a camera and I set up some lights. Chris Pinto taught me how to do this. I've learned a few things from him. He's a, he was a, he was a college trained filmmaker. So I turned out all the lights in here, sat in here, and I had the lights angled in such a way as it looked pretty neat. And I'm sitting right over there and I'm looking into the camera and I'm explaining how people can be saved. And I said, first of all, repent of your sins. And some people went nuts over that. Oh, Hogger's got a false doctrine. Repentance is works. He believes in a work salvation. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh. Where did the sorrow come from that caused you to repent? God, for godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation that needeth not to be repented of. It was God who brought them to confess their sins and repent of their sins. God, we are sorry we did this. God, we do not want to die. I'm telling you, God does make examples out of the wicked for us to see so that we sober up and say, I don't want to be like that. We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses, see, Moses is Christ. He's the intercessor. The Israelites know that they cannot speak to God directly. And they don't want God speaking directly to them because they heard his voice on Mount Sinai and it just blew their brains. So they said, Moses, will you go and inquire of God and let him know that we are sorry for our sins and we are begging for God's forgiveness. Now, even some preachers might say, well, that's not really the reason why you should get saved. You should get saved because you fell in love with Jesus. Let me tell you about me. I didn't go down to that altar, the Niangua Bible camp, because I loved Jesus so much that I wanted to be with him forever. I went to that altar because I was scared to death of going to hell. I still am. So pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So what's Jesus? Why did Jesus reference this passage? Number one, Jesus knows he's going to be lifted up on a pole, a tree, a cross. And he knows that he is going to take upon himself all of the sins of mankind and all of the enemies of both God and man is going to be destroyed when Jesus is killed. It's like he's going to take them all to himself, pull the pin of a grenade out and let it go. Yes, he died doing that, but he killed his enemies. What did Samson do? That's what Samson did. He said, God, give me strength one more time. Just one more time. And he grabbed the two pillars and brought them together. And those principalities and powers that were up on the roof fell. There was some 3,000. That represents, I think, the third of the angels that fall to the earth. And by what means are these evil angels kicked out of heaven? By means of the cross of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. And the Bible says that he killed more of his enemies in his death than he did in his life. I love that story. I love what it means. That is typology. 
That's the Bible saying this is as that. And when you learn the Bible that way, you'll never read it the same ever again. It, and it'll never bore you. It will never bore you. When you understand, when you look for typology in every story that you see in the Bible, or understand that every prophecy from Isaiah to Malachi may have had a partial fulfillment, but not a complete fulfillment. When you understand and see that, you'll never read the Bible the same way again. You'll read those prophets and say, you know, there's something here I bet is going to happen again. I think God's going to do this all over again. And believe it, he will. So this is why I say that it's actually more important now that we trust our Bibles than any previous generation of believers in Jehovah God to believe what God said. It falls upon us to believe it more than they did because we're going to see literally everything fulfilled in those last days. Everything is going to be fulfilled. So, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The fiery serpents, they were not anacondas, they were not rattlesnakes, black snakes, copperheads, cottonmouths, king snakes, cobras, pythons. They were none of those. They were spirits. The fact that the Bible calls them fiery serpents tells you that because all spirits, all of the angels, both good and bad, are made of fire. Flaming fire, the Bible says. So that's their, that's their substance of their being is light and fire. And these serpents, fiery serpents going in amongst the camp biting them and since they're spirits they are they cannot be killed you can't outrun them they will chase you down until they have bitten you and what is the significance of that john chapter uh 20 verse 31 these things are written i already read this this is what i did last wednesday let me do Let's see here. We were in Romans 10 a while ago. Let me read this. Verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And you hear some people say, you know, I had the head knowledge of Jesus Christ, but I didn't have the heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a good statement. Because anybody can think about Jesus and think that it's possible that he did actually live and do miracles. But they think it in their rational mind, but they do not believe it in their heart. And I was watching a guy on YouTube the other. He wasn't even talking about re religious things or nothing. It was Dr. Stephen Greer who channels UFOs to come down. Wherever he goes, he can call UFOs in to come visit them. And he said, because I'm a medical doctor, I know certain things that a lot of people don't know. And he said, one of the things that I know is, is that we must believe that these entities are real and we must open ourselves up to them. And that's done with the heart of man. And he said, I'm an ER doctor. I know for a fact 
that our heart has the same kind of cells as the brain does. Your heart has neurons on it. Let me, let me read this article. Pain, is it all in the brain or in the heart? Scientists have reported that pain is all, always created by the brain. This may not be entirely true. Pain is not only a sensory experience, but also can be associated with emotional, cognitive, or social components. The heart, and this is a scientific journal, so when it says the heart, it's not speaking of like the soul of man, it's speaking of the, the blood pumping heart. The heart is considered the source of emotions, desire, and wisdom. Therefore, the aim of this article was to review the available evidence about the role of the heart in pain modulation. And he says, in 1991, Dr. Armour discovered that the heart has its little brain or intrinsic cardiac nervous system. Here's a doctor now who has done the research who says that your heart actually has a brain in it. Isn't that something? Now, how did Paul know this? He didn't. How did Isaiah know it? He didn't. How did Jesus know it? He knew it because he made it. And he said, this heart brain is composed of approximately 40,000 neurons that are alike neurons in the brain, meaning that the heart has its own nervous system. In addition, the heart communicates with the brain in many methods, neurologically, biochemically, biophysically, and energetically. The vagus nerve, which is 80% afferent, carries information from the heart and other inter internal organs to the brain. Signals from the heart brain redirect to the medulla, hypothalamus, those are parts of your brain, the thalamus and amygdala and the cerebral cortex. Thus, the heart sends more signals to the brain than vice versa. Look at that. It's your heart that believes it. Amen. And I, and I, I was just sort of really taken aback. When I found out that somebody that I know had been friends with, loved him as a dear brother in the Lord, and he's a smart guy. He is a scientist, and he knows the scientific, what do they call it, the scientific process of how you go from a theory to finding that that theory is either a fact or it's wrong. And it goes through a scientific process. There's like seven steps in this process. And he knows all of that. But I found out that he was going around telling everybody that he now believes the earth is flat. And I'm going, I don't believe you. A guy was telling me this on the phone. As he's telling me this, I'm texting my friend. And I said, I got a guy on the phone here that tells me that you told him that you believe the earth has to be flat. And I was waiting for my friend to write back and say, I never said any, I never said no such a thing. And I was going to lay into this guy on the phone. What he sent back was, I have a lot of serious questions. And I couldn't believe it. And I tried to reason with him. I tried to show him from the Bible how it's impossible. But he wouldn't let go of it. And to this day, he, he's still that way, he won't let go of it. And I started asking the question, God, how is it that a man who has a brain like he does? He knows math. He knows science. Very dedicated. Um... Thoughtful, reasoning, rational human being 
And yet he does not accept the fact that the earth is round. He believes it's flat. And I, so I said, God, how did that happen? How did, how did he even get turned over to that? And I pondered that for a while and God reminded me of Ezekiel 14. Where the elders of Israel would go to Ezekiel and say, Ezekiel, inquire of the Lord for us. In other words, you go pray and ask God what God has in store for us here. Go find out what God says about us. So Ezekiel goes to God and God says, should I be inquired of them at all? Because they have idols in their heart. They have a stumbling block in their heart. And because of that, I'm going to let them believe lies. I'm not going to, I'm, I could probably stand right in front of them and try to tell them the truth all day long and they wouldn't listen to me. And I want to tell you something. If God can't change somebody's mind, you can't. There's no way you can. And so it's the heart. And that's important. Because all around us, you young people listen, all around us, a majority of the people in this world believe what we were told in school is that we came up from monkeys. Brother Sterling, who had an eighth grade education and no more than that, asked one of the most brilliant questions I've ever heard on that issue. Sterling said, well, if man came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Yeah. See, it don't take a high school diploma to figure that one out, does it? And what happens is, what you believe in your heart. And this article said there's more in the way of the conversation. There's more that the that the heart says to the brain than there is the brain saying it to the heart. So no matter what your eyes see. Your heart can believe and know something entirely different than that. Because we walk by and not by. That's because the heart has overruled the brain. And it's told the brain, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. My heart has been in constant communication with God. So, Mike, tell your brain to keep its big mouth shut. Are you saying that to me now? I think Melissa just said, Mike, keep your mouth shut. Look what time it is. No, I know. But that just, that blows my mind. The heart, man believeth unto righteousness. You don't just confess it. That's a brain knowledge. That is, that is somebody who goes to, I don't care what kind of church it is, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Assembly of God, Baptist, who, do, who goes through the motions of what the other church people are doing, participates in the rituals of the church, gives money to the church, has fellowship with everybody in the church, but the truth of it is, they're not saved because their heart doesn't believe it. And the heart always overrides the brain. Always. So they look like they're good and saved on the outside. But on the inside, they don't believe it. Amen? And there's the science of it right there. When did that come out? Uh, I don't see a date here. Anyway, that, that just fascinates me that you have a brain. Your heart has its own brain. Whew. Man, I like that. 
As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We looked at Numbers 21. And, and here we have the doctrine of grace through faith. God is sending down his grace in that if they just merely look upon the serpent made of brass, that instantly all of the venom will be destroyed in their body and they will no longer be sick and they will not die. And it takes just the simplest of faith to do that. Because you would tell yourself, what have you got to lose? You're dying anyway. Why don't you just look upon that? And when they would look upon it, all of a sudden, the venom is gone. Now, have, having had that done to them, remember, these are the same people who walked through the midst of the Red Sea, who saw God's presence on Mount Sinai, who saw Moses coming down, his face shining so bright they couldn't look at him. This is, these are the people who, when Moses struck a rock, water came out from the middle of a rock. They saw manna, food from heaven, come down every day. They wanted quails, so God sent millions of quails to them. These are the people who saw the miracles firsthand that God did. And yet they always fussed and complained and moaned and whined and rebelled against God. Always. So as Moses, uh, I'll have to wait till next week. We'll look at this poison that caused these people to die. Where does the snake keep its poison at? Its mouth. God put it there for a reason. He put it there for a reason. To, to give us understanding. To watch out. For what people say, what comes out of their mouth, it could be poison and you wouldn't know it.